Hi there, I'm Aaron, and I'm trying to learn more about big data. Now, I have access to a couple things that the average guy and gal does not. One is my buddy Henry. He's like a big data whisperer. Big data. The other is I have access to the entire IBM phone directory. I can get anybody to talk to me. Aaron, stop calling me! On this episode, we're going to learn about Spark in the cloud. All right, this Hangout on Air is live. Hello, folks. I hope you're working not watching our videos all day long. <laughs> so uh, let's hop right into this. Let's learn about Spark and Spark in the Cloud. OK, sounds good. Let me start my screen share. Let's see how this goes. All right, can you see my screen? All right, yes, I can see it, sir. OK, so we're going to talk about Spark and give you guys an introduction to Spark and essentially talk about the value adds and why you won't want to even use Spark in your everyday lives. So let's move right into it. So the problem, keeping up is brutal. Even just trying to m maintain speed and keep up with technology, you may have a lot of challenges. So it's not only a matter of like getting ahead, it's just a matter of just keeping up. Speeding up data processing is a big thing for companies, IT corporations nowadays. You have to be able to, you know, be able to uh, take data and speed up the processing, use a lot of the different data sets, and be able to simplify your developments across these new technologies. As the new technologies come out, you have to keep up again. There's a, a big key point that we have um, the issues with. You would want faster, deeper, richer, and interactive analytics. A lot of the new data nowadays requires that you have these technologies available to derive insight. And most importantly, open source has been a big thing in today's environment. You don't want to get locked into any particular vendor. So say you start one year on a project, and then you find out that you want to switch vendors. If you're in the open source environment, you don't have to worry or deal with anything like that. So put on your helmet, and it's time to speed things up with Spark. Exactly. Henry, have you ever sat there with a helmet on in the office while you're uh, processing data really quickly just to see what people do? Hey, not exactly. I've never had that opportunity, but eventually, <laughs> with Spark, I may need to. <laughs> exactly. Excellent. So with Spark, um, it attempts to solve three of our biggest challenges today. And if you look at the image on the right, it sort of represents what IT industry looks like. It's very disorganized. I mean, you have all your parts, your components, everything is there. But unless you really, really know what you're doing, it's very difficult to get to the end results and derive insight from your data. What Spark aims to do is provide you with a flexible and organized environment, as you can see with that picture on the right. You'll organize it into some sort of assembly line or batch processing mode, and everything gets done sequentially and in order. And definitely, this is one of the biggest things that Spark can help you do is get organized so that you can keep up with the rapid pace of technology. Nice. So next, we'll get into some Spark capabilities and kind of talk about this at a high level. <clears throat> so this image here represents what Spark can do as a whole. Um, you can view this image the way it is or even flip it um, on the side where Spark core is at the bottom. So this core represents all the basic functionality that you can do with Spark. The first thing we'll chat about is the Spark streaming. Spark streaming sits on top of our Spark core. So you have different libraries and capabilities to do real-time analytics processing, and it allows you to get insights immediately. In some use cases, you don't want to wait minutes or even days to find out your results. And a good example would be traffic, right? If you're doing analysis on traffic, you need to know right away whether or not um, there's going to be an accident up above the road or you know whether or not you have to take a different route. So Spark Streamings allow you to get the insight in near real time. Nice. Now, Henry, as we're going through these, uh, can these different capabilities be combined together and you use them to, you know, in one solution type of thing? So you're using them kind of all at once? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And one of the power and um, capability of Spark is it allows you to unify 
and combine all of these into a pipeline. So nice. in one instance, for example, you can start with Spark Streaming. You get in your real-time data, and perhaps some analysis can be done in real time, while others you may need like a machine learning library, which is the next item here, to do predictive analytics on it. And so nice. you can spread out the different pipelines and continue with your analytics that way. Excellent. So that's a great segue into the next section, which is machine learning. And Spark has these um, ML lib libraries within that you can easily invoke, and they will allow you to train and create data sets and models to do predictive analytics on it. Spark SQL is um, definitely something common enough for folks to pick up. You know, structured query language is common. Most people nowadays would know how to query data. Spark provides this interface so that you can access your data without having to learn a brand new language. So definitely a key feature of Spark. Um, a lot of folks can just come in and start using Spark by running queries on their data. Excellent. Now with this GraphX, um, it's a graph analysis. Uh, so this, the use case for this is mainly around um, social media. So if you want to, for example, find the influence of someone on Twitter, you can use these graphical um, algorithms to compute the relationship between this particular person of interest, maybe the, the president of the United States, and see how many followers he has and how much influence he has based on the tweets and the different um, retweets and things like that. So using these graph analytics library, you can determine stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. Now, is that like the type of thing that LinkedIn might use, you know, that, that kind of graph concept? Yes, that's a great question. For LinkedIn, they use graphical concepts to kind of recommend even you know, who may be the person you want to add to your contacts, to your network, and they determine that based on your profile, your interest, your um, any kind of achievements or certifications. So yeah. everything has to do with relationships and graph um, analysis you can do with this GraphX. Neat. That's cool. So for Spark, basically, it's not a new concept, right? There's, you can always achieve what you can do today with Spark, but you can do so much faster if you use something like Spark. Um, this slide here kind of shows the different industry in which you can uh, um, accelerate your analytics. Um, telecommunication, cable companies, schools can um, improve um, churn reduction, cybersecurity in any industry. Obviously, that's an important thing. Network performance optimization. Any industry will require um, network performance. Um, customer behavior analytics. This is a big thing with machine learning to be able to predict what a customer might buy um, based on their purchasing habits. And you can use Spark to do that um, really fast. Predictive maintenance. This is a relatively new um, Internet of Thing technologies where truck drivers, for example, and their vehicles on the road, you want to be able to predict when certain parts may fail. So with the IoT technology, they'll send you um, the insight immediately in real time, and then you know, hey, maybe this component is going to fail. I should fix it up at the next rest stop, for example. So oh, that's there's, cool. there's a number of things you can do. Nice. Now, do you have a favorite uh, amongst these? Um, customer behavior analytics is definitely the most interesting to me because it nice. actually applies. You know, everybody goes out shopping, and mm -hmm. you see Amazon recommendations, Netflix movie recommendations, mm -hmm. everything um, along those lines are done using machine learning, and Spark can help you do that much nice. faster. Oh, excellent. Okay, so some of the key reasons that we've cited here for interest in Spark and why you might be interested in it. Performance is one of the biggest factors of why you would want to use Spark. Uh, most of you probably have heard of MapReduce, um, but Spark is basically the next generation. It's the in-memory architecture, which means everything is done within memory so that you don't have to transfer data um, to and from different disks and reduce a lot of the input-output, and that will save a lot of time for the computation. Now, depending on the use case that you're operating with, you can go anywhere from 20 to 100 times faster for a common task when you use Spark. Phew, that's fast. Oh, yeah. You can be a lot more productive. So the question, Aaron, that you asked earlier about whether or not you can combine different mm -hmm. um, libraries, yeah, you definitely can. Everything is unified nice. in the Spark stack. You know, at the very base, you have your core. And we'll talk more about the capabilities and the details of how Spark operates in a future session. But okay. for today, we're just going to talk about the high level. 
you have various analytics methods, and so that we talked about that with the machine learning library, the streaming, the GraphX, the SQL. You can process data from multiple sources. Spark has a simple but very powerful syntax, and actually, if you're using something like Java, um, you can reduce um, the lines of code for what is written in Java over to something that you can write using Spark, either a Scala or Python. And in some cases, you can reduce that up to five times less code. Nice. It's the universal programming model. So if you have any experience in programming, you can use the same type of model here in Spark. So there's no new models that you need to learn. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned here with the new common programming languages, if you've done something in Java, you can port that Java code over with some minimal effort. But the recommended language that you would want to use is either Python or Scala. And you can do something in um, Python and Scala with like one or two lines of code versus in Java, maybe like 10 or 20 lines. Nice. Now, for people that are new to this and might not have experience with either Python or Scala, do you have a recommendation on what they basically start learning with? No, that's a great question. Spark itself is written in Scala. So typically, it's, um, a lot of examples are provided in Scala. But Python is definitely up and coming, and it's probably a more common language. You might have heard about Python before, and this may be your first time hearing about Scala. So nice. my recommendation is if you have no preference, you know, go ahead and try out Scala first. You know, get a feel for if Spark is actually what you need. Okay. And as you, you know, get into it, you might find that Python is more easier to use um, in the long run. Nice. Great advice. Um, new tools are continuously being developed for Spark. So because of the framework and the way the Spark stack is structured, anytime a new tool is added, you don't have to revamp all your code. You just um, learn that new tool itself and then be able to take advantage of all the Spark capabilities. And finally, this is a key point too, leveraging existing investments. You know, Companies do not want to redo and revamp their entire infrastructure just because they want to use a new technology. Spark works well within existing Hadoop ecosystem, and you are able to use Spark both on cloud and on premise as well. So definitely um, a lot of flexibility in that realm. Nice. And are you seeing people kind of going towards the Spark on the cloud versus on premise, or are you seeing kind of both right now? The trend is definitely going towards the cloud. And okay. one of the key components of Spark is that it allows you to use notebook-based environments. Mm -hmm. And you guys don't know what notebooks are. It's this really nice tool that everything of Spark together. And all you do is work within your web browser to interface with this notebook. You run the code directly on this notebook environment. You get the results back. You can do proof of concepts. And you learn quickly how Spark works without having to download or install anything. Awesome. Yeah, and I think, Henry, uh, for our next part of this video, we'll probably do an actual demonstration in the cloud with notebooks, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, we're going to look into a um, New York motor vehicle accidents use case. So nice. we'll walk through the different data points of where accidents occur more frequently, what type of accidents, and we'll be able to map out directly what kind of um, where the different locations of accidents occur more often. And you'll see this in the notebook environment. That's exciting. So folks, make sure that you check our second video. We're going to have some good stuff on there for you to check out. For sure, yep. And Spark, just like wine, it improves with age. Um, it is open source if you haven't um, picked that up by now. Um, open source, the community is rapidly growing. A lot of contributors and developers and committers to the Spark framework. So it's getting better, it's getting faster, and more tools and um, technologies are being embedded into the Spark framework. Great. Okay, so on this slide, I just wanted to show, you know, we see this main core right in the center. We've seen it, you know, in a different view. You have the Apache Spark core, and then the SQL, the Spark streaming, the machine learning, the GraphX sits on top of it. The thing I wanted to show on this slide was that it interfaces and interacts with a number of data sources. If you have Hadoop, data sources, it can interact with Spark. If you have relational data sources, it can interact with Spark. Mainframe data sources or even data warehouse data sources, they can all be plugged in to the Spark architecture. Nice. 
And this slide is a little bit busy, um, but the intent was to kind of show you the specific concrete examples of what Spark can interact with um, at the base. You know, you have IBM Big Insights with the Hadoop, you have Clouded, Dash DB, all of these are the cloud based offerings. You have other non IBM cloud offerings, um, Amazon Web Service. Uh, MongoDB, Cassandra, Microsoft Azure, Rackspace, Reddit, and even different cloud applications like Salesforce and NetSuite. And like I mentioned, even on-prem technologies like Oracle, SAP, IBM DB2, you can all interact directly with the Spark core and take advantage of its capabilities. So we talked about what Spark is, and up until this point, we haven't said what Spark isn't. That's so right. let's go into that right now. Let's jump right into that. Hey, look, there I am. Okay, so one thing I never mentioned was that Spark is not a data store, and that's in fact true. Um, Spark doesn't store data on its own. It has to attach to another data store. Mm -hmm. Spark is an analytics engine, and it takes the different data store that you can work with the, the, the engine itself. Okay. Spark is not only for Hadoop. So if you are starting out in the big data space and you're hearing about Hadoop and Spark, you may think no, they're part together, they can't be independent and separate. That's not the case. Spark works really well with Hadoop, especially HDFS, but you can definitely use Spark as a standalone and a separate system as well. And that, yeah, that goes along with that first bullet point in that, you know, using HDFS as a data store is a great way to work with Spark, right? Right, exactly. And for those folks that are coming in from the machine learning world, Spark is not just for machine learning. It has a number of machine learning libraries, and it does it very well. But it also handles much broader tasks um, equally well. And that includes like Spark streaming, um, GraphX, and SQL analysis on it. Excellent. All right, so that concludes the presentation on the introduction to Spark. All right, man. Stop sharing. Let people see your face. Look at this guy. He knows his stuff. You folks are lucky. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, uh, folks, make sure you tune in for our second episode. We're the Big Data Dudes, and uh, we hope you learned something great. There's going to be a lot more to come. All right. Take care, everybody. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye now. Bye.